We are now streaming live on Facebook. This will be recorded and chopped up into YouTube segments for the, for the audience. Uh, just want to go around the horn here and introduce ourselves. I'll start off. I'm Chris Saxman, Executive Director of Virginia Free. I served four terms in the uh, House of Tickets, 2000 businessman by, uh, by training and upbringing, and now uh, moved from Stanton to the western suburbs of Richmond. I'll go to Matt Walton. I am Matt Walton, uh, the a contributor with Bearing Drift, uh, former candidate for the House of Delegates in 2015, Republican nominee for the 74th uh, District, uh, live in Henrico County, and am a teacher by trade. Andrea? I'm Andrea Epps, uh, senior contributor for Bearing Drift, mother of two wonderful kids and two fantastic dogs, and I take care of them and mom and write when I need to write. Okay, we'll go to Chris Noe next. Hi, I'm Chris Noe. I am a uh, homeschool mom, which has made me very popular lately. Um, I've been homeschooling for 13 years and involved in local politics for about 20. And um, I am a writer on Bearing Drift. Okay, DJ McGuire. Uh, DJ McGuire, senior contributor to Bearing Drift, a uh, former Republican nominee for local office in Spotsylvania, but now I call myself the conservative feather of the Democratic Party. Brian Shaneman. Hi, everybody. Brian Shaneman. I am the uh, editor in chief emeritus of Bearing Drift. I am a former uh, House of Delegates candidate as well, former uh, local candidate in Fairfax County. I was the chief elected administrator in Fairfax for two years. I also served in the Bush administration, and I am currently the political legislative director for the Seafarers Union of North America. And Merle Russ. Hi, I'm Merle Russ, I'm senior contributor with Bearing Drift, where I focus on national security and defense issues. I'm a 25-year uh, veteran of the United States Army, also a veteran of the defense industry. Now I'm a small businessman and a wine grower in Loudoun County. All right. That's us, Dr. Cameron Webb, the <laughs> candidate. Look at that smile. He's got that candidate's glow, doesn't he? Yeah. He's, he does. He's got they, they what he's all doing. He's got it. They it's not the candidate's glow. No, it's, it's, not all. Not it's all. It's the ring light. It's you that's what I'm talking things. about. That's oh, what I need. Mean. I need one of those. He's, he's got that Christmas morning, every day look about him, doesn't he? It does. Yeah. All right, Dr. Webb, go and introduce yourself. Give us a little bio, and we'll start asking some questions. Thanks. Will do, but before I jump in, DJ McGuire, you said you're a Spotsy guy. I, I'm from Spotsy. Uh, grew up right off of Route 3 in Catharpin, so just down the road from Orange County. But where are you in the county? Uh, well, I was uh, all the way on the other end of the county, down by uh, where uh, Tidewater Trail almost hits the Caroline County line. Uh, right. I'm down in Hampton Roads now, but I was okay. up there for about 10 years. Gotcha, gotcha. Well, nice to meet you all. Uh, it's really my pleasure. My name's Cameron Webb, as you said. I'm an internal medicine doctor at the University of Virginia, also a lawyer, so I'm obviously a glutton for punishment. I uh, went to the 25th grade for the teachers out there. And, uh, and so, you know, for me, I... List, which means that these last four months, I've been working on the COVID unit, taking care of, of coronavirus patients as well. Um, and I'm also the Director of Health Policy and Equity at the UVA School of Medicine, which is a role that I, I really love. I love working with students and teaching them about our incredibly broken and fractured healthcare system and ways that we can improve it. And part of my insight into that came from working uh, in the White House. I worked from 2016, 2017 in the White House as a White House Fellow. Um, first six months on the White House healthcare team for President Obama, last six months on the Domestic Policy Council healthcare team for President Trump. Really, uh, you know, bridging those two very different administrations, I learned a ton about where we have some commonalities in this conversation and where we can really move forward thoughtfully. And so that's a big part of what I bring with me into this space. Um, a lot of people ask me, you know, you got a perfectly reasonable life. Why would you ruin it by going into politics? And I think that for me, uh, uh, so much of it has to do with just this notion of service. I'm, I'm in the service professions, haven't for a while. But I just recognize we've got a healthcare system that's, you know, a fifth of our economy and it's not working efficiently. And I think that there are a lot of things that we can do to ensure access, but also to unlock the potential of, of what our system can and should be. And, and so I'm excited to, to have those conversations and have them in a thoughtful way and bring my experience to bear in all of that. And then, you know, of course, a global health pandemic just came and sat down in the middle of my campaign. And so uh, we've got that dynamic too. And I want to be helpful in, in that response. And so I'm just excited to be with you all today and, and uh, get into the whitewater with you. But uh, it's great to have you on board, and thank you to you and your team for helping 
helping us get this coordinated and working on it for a couple of weeks. Um, obviously, your background is substantive, uh, impressive. It's not often you see a, a, a double professional degree candidate in the, running for office these days. I guess I mean the only question that comes up anytime you talk to a candidate is why are you running for this office? And I, I'll put that to you. For me, it, it, like I said, I, I see patients every day. That's kind of what I do in my day job. I'm also teaching about our healthcare system. And it just got harder and harder to explain to my patients, well, it's just the way that it is because the system doesn't work very well. And harder and harder to justify to my students, well, it's just the way that it is and our system doesn't work very well. And then in the middle of all that, we have this, uh, this Texas versus United States case. And that was actually the tipping point for me. It was the Texas versus U.S. case that uh, you know, Judge Reed O'Connor down in Texas said would strike down the entire Affordable Care Act. And like it, love it, or hate it, the Affordable Care Act as the law of the land has stood the test of 70 plus different attempts to repeal it. And, and I think that the reality is that just eliminating the ACA without putting something better and more thoughtful in place, to me, I said is just a, a never event for us. We have to be ready to move forward with our healthcare system in a way that, that ensures that people have access to the care that they need. The stakes are too high for my patients. So that, that's really what did it for me. That's what got me into this conversation and, and got me into this idea of, well, maybe this is a time for me to step in and run a campaign really focused on saying we can fix our healthcare system. We can lean into the best things about our system and also make sure that everybody has access to it. And, um, and that's, that's what I aim to do. So that's what, that's what did it for me. So it's, health, it's healthcare centric. That's a, that's a great focus. Let's do a little, I'm going to pull back a little bit here. We, what I do when I interview Candace for the first time is do a little rapid fire, uh, mm -hmm. more personal stuff. Don't get, don't get too excited about these things. Like what's your favorite book or most recently read book? Oh man. Uh, so the book that I'm reading right now is called Fair Market. It's called Free Market Fairness. Uh, and I think it's just kind of existing at that intersection between our free market and really un unlocking the potential of a free market that's also moving us toward a, a more, um, you know, a society that's more equitable in terms of opportunities for success, how we can leverage the market to achieve that. So, so that's what I'm currently reading. Um, I'm a nerd. I like getting into the philosophy kind of stuff, but, um, but that's what's on my bookshelf right now. Uh, favorite movie or most recently watched movie that you would recommend to a friend or loved one? Oh, man. Favorite movie. Um, let's see. Oh, that's a tough one. I watch pretty trash TV, man. Um, I think that... Uh, that what, who does so, so you watch cable news, do you? That, ah. <laughs> uh, well, I'll, I'll say this is kind of a hedge because TV shows are more like movies now. I just rewatched Game of Thrones for the second time. Awesome. That's kind of how I've been spending okay. my spending my free time. And so... Uh, so there's that. Right now I'm watching this show, Snowpiercer, that's on TNT. Oh. Also really good. Check it out. Okay. Uh, my son uh, got me started watching on Snowpiercer. But here's the book I want to recommend if you're in that lane of philosoph philosophy. It's Ethics in the National Economy by uh, uh, an Austrian priest, Dr. Uh, uh, Father Heinrich Pesch. It's, uh, it's right along the theme of what you're talking about as far as you know, taking a free market approach and doing what you should be doing or ought to be doing to make this make our society more equitable. It's, it's an outstanding book. Awesome. Um, oh, okay, uh, favorite sports teams? <laughs> the Washington football franchise has been my favorite sports team since I was a kid. I was eight and they won the Super Bowl. I thought they were just God's gift to sports. Uh, and then I've been suffering with the rest of, of the Washington fans since then. I, for one, I'm glad they're changing the name. It's just an unnecessary distraction. Now we can move forward. And plus, Dan Snyder's done everything wrong uh, for the last, uh, I don't know how many years. So might as well start getting something right. All right. Uh, is that baseball, basketball, any other uh, – Pro teams you follow or college teams in particular? Yeah, in college, I've always been a North Carolina Tar Heels fan, which is ironic because I'm a UVA guy. Um, but again, I think I'm, I, was, I was really shaped by sports in the early 90s. And so there was, the, you know, the teams with Vince Carter and Anton Jameson and Eric Montross. I, I was just, I was enamored. So I'm a, I'm a Tar Heels fan, can't help it. Um, and college sports are my preference. I love pro basketball, but I think there's nothing like March Madness. I mean, those kids leave it all out on the floor, and I, I love watching it. So I was sad to miss it this year. And plus, you, you dropped you there another year. So, so I'll take it. <laughs> okay. Well, you, you you struck out on all of those. You didn't do well at all. I'm just going to be upfront with you. <laughs> Come on. It's just you know, this, 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 kind of a disturbing answer. I go to UVA, but I cheer for UNC. I mean, that's. I mean, was it, maybe, I was, you're the, maybe you're the perfect Democrat. Chris, at least he didn't say he, he, votes for, he, he roots for Virginia Tech. So he, he got oh, at least hey that now. part of it okay. Hey, now. Not, not now. He might, no, no. Look, look, he <laughs> might be. 
my wife's from Appomattox, and and every time we talk about UVA and Appomattox, they're like, mm, we're tech fans around here. So that that's one thing. And listen, I was a UNC fan before I was a UVA alum, and so I I'm loyal. That's all it is. So you got to stick. You're stick killing me, oh, Doctor. Look, you're killing me, Doctor Webb, <laughs> as a <laughs> NC State alumni. No, you are not, DJ. All right, you could be the perfect. Democrat to go to the to the to Congress for all these Republicans on here because you know if you're going to be that loyal to the Democrats, I'm just saying, you know. Well, listen. Working listen. the Trump White House, just saying. Listen. What what I know is that that's that's sports loyalty. That's an important thing. I think the loyalty I'm talking about here is to the people of this district, and I think you got to recognize this district spans a lot of different perspectives. Yes, it does. It's a very diverse district. Now let's let's just follow up here briefly on sports because it is so topical it's not like the Redskins uh, the former uh, team known as the Redskins are not in the news do you have a particular name that you prefer that have been mentioned so far I like senators actually Carter and I were talking about this yesterday because he's also a big Washington fan and and uh, I, I like the idea of, of the senators I think I like what they did with the branding with the Washington Nationals it is a big part of that DC identity Washington Capitals we you know there's a lot of enthusiasm behind that team so stick with what's working uh, I hate what they did with the Washington Wizards uh, that that just never worked for me so pick a name that has something to do with the character of the area. Oh, that was yeah, Andrea. Just, just it's funny. My my daughter is a half Indian, literally, and she last time she shared her views on the whole Redskins thing. She was actually angry that they were changing the name. Hmm. So just Good perspective. There. All right, DJ. Thanks for joining us, DJ. Appreciate that. Um, just yeah. Ap ap apologies, just all. I actually had a plumber come early. Oh, that's why you put a mask on. I thought you were being a smart ass. No. Pand pandemic having here. Let's just jump into the issues. You you mentioned healthcare, and then I'm going to go to Andre for an environmental question. But on healthcare, since that was your topic going into this thing, you said early on, you know, keep the things that are working. What do you see that is working in our healthcare system, Dr. Cameron Webb? I, well, I have to speak on behalf of my colleagues. I think we have an incredible healthcare workforce. We have incredible technologies. We have a system that literally, you know, you can get a cure, you can get the best treatment in the world to so many conditions here in the United States, the challenges that not everybody can get access to those things. And so the way for us to make sure that people can get access to the care that they need, that's the conversation we need to be having is how to get, get that access to, to as many folks as possible. I mean, the reality is that people's health outcomes are so dictated by often where they live and how much they have. And so at a fundamental level, if we wanna have a thriving society, we need to have thriving access to education and thriving access to healthcare. We know that to be true. And so, um, so yeah, I think where I, where I start is I want everybody to have access to the care that they need. And I also want everybody to, so that's one of the key values, but I also want people to be able to choose, uh, choose where they get their care and how they get their care. And I think that's another key value and, and threading that needle, I think is where we need to be at this moment. Okay, Andrea, I'm gonna jump over to Brian. He has a question on COVID and then we'll get back to Andrea. I'm gonna keep him the consistent here in topics. Well, I, I, honestly, I think the, the one big question that I have, and it's this is a generic question that I've been asking everybody that's campaigning right now, with COVID-19 and, and the way that, that that has changed how we do business with each other, I mean, normally we wouldn't be on, uh, on a show like this, uh, you know, we'd be talking to you in person or something like that. Um, how has that impacted your campaigning? How are you reaching out to voters now? How do you get your message across when you can't go out and do stuff like go knock on their door and go talk to them? Yeah, I mean, we've got to we've got to do this real 21st century campaigning. So for us, it's using spaces like this, leaning into Facebook. We have I have a weekly Facebook Live event that's a COVID update um, that in no way is partisan, and then the whole nature of it is just getting real factual information out to people. We have thousands of folks who watch this every single Monday night at 7 p.m. And so yes, reaching folks on the various platforms: Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube. That's a start. But I think really it's just being creative about the way that we connect to person to person. Um, for us, reaching out to a range of different groups of individuals, you know, certainly trying to find teachers, uh, law enforcement officials, just really connecting with people exactly where they are um, and starting to have those conversations. And it was one thing in a primary, right? There are Democratic committees all over the district. Uh, I think it's a different thing now when we're getting into this conversation of there's a large number of either independent or undifferentiated individuals. There are a lot of conservatives here in the district who we want to make sure we're having that conversation with so they know who I am, what I'm about, and how I would aim to represent this district. And so that's the work that we're doing. It's just working hard to find people, meet them where they are. I expect that, you know, the way that COVID is looking these days, 
we'll be doing this through the fall. You know, we'll be having these conversations in virtual spaces. So, so we've, uh, we've gotten pretty good at it over the last few months. Expect to, to keep, keep banging. Okay, Andrea, you have a question on the environment. Well, I have all, I have a piggyback off of on the COVID real very quickly. Um, I have a friend of mine who's a virologist told me at the beginning of this that if we didn't handle it correctly, that going into the next, which would be this current flu season, that that one protein changes with a regular flu and you end up with an R naught of four. And the average person doesn't understand what that means. How, how do you think the best way is to get politics out of covid so that meta so you know so that the scientists and the med you know, med medical end of it can actually start you know doing the work um yeah. you're, you're you're absolutely right i mean i think that some of it is is just we have to depoliticize it i mean every aspect of this virus has been politicized and so i think now that we're seeing a surge in cases it's not about who's right it's not about who's wrong it's about how we can get past this virus to get our economy rolling again and we know that the best way to do that is to stop the new transmission of virus. I love the fact that you raised the flu season because I was just on a call with a you know, bunch of school board members all across the district have been reaching out to me and they're like, so what should we be doing? Uh, you know, want to get our kids at school. Every, I want to get my kids back in school, trust me. And so, so it's how do we act? You've got to stick to the basics, the basics we've been talking about for a long time, which is prevent transmission of this virus. Absolutely, you know, wear a mask in public spaces. If you're feeling sick, stay home. You know, make sure that you're washing your hands regularly. Those basics of preventing transmission, there's nothing political about that. That's just oh, normal good science. And Andrea, to your question about things changing, you know, we've been chasing H1N1 or the different types of flu, those different proteins. Every year we give our best guess on how it's going to change. And then we have a, a vaccine that's usually less than 50% effective because we, we are, we're guessing. You know, COVID is mutating. It's changing. That spike protein that we're going to be using to develop a vaccine, that's changing too. And right now we know that that's, it's changing in a way where it's still hopefully going to be effective, whatever virus, you know, whether it's Moderna or the UK vaccine that they're creating, whatever vaccine we create is still going to be effective. But regardless, we've got to get our stuff in order, right? And so, you know, I was out in, in my family and I went to the Great Smoky Mountains just uh, the other week. I was out near Gatlinburg, uh, over by Pigeon Forge, and there were literally thousands of people out there, not a mask to be seen. We got back home, and suddenly that's a hot spot for COVID, right? And, and I think the reality is just we are, we are chasing our tails because we keep seeing these cases go up. Let's just all, in solidarity, say, let's get ahead of this so we can get back to business as usual. We just need to make that collective statement. I'd love for that to come from the top. And going, staying on healthcare, we're going to go to Chris and then DJ. There we go. Thank you. Um, I didn't want y'all to have to hear my dogs, but then eventually it just turned into me. Um, so Andrea sort of covered my, uh, the first part of what I was going to ask about depoliticizing this, but then sort of as you're talking about that this is going to be with us for a while, how do we make sure that kids have what they need for computers, internet access, um, adults to oversee if we're going to be stuck in this distance learning um, situation and do these changes actually offer us a way to look at op uh, an opportunity to look at education differently than we have in the past and you, you answered that you answered the question right then and there that's what we need to be doing you know that idea of broadband access is critical infrastructure you know in madison county and buckingham county right near near me kids have been going to mcdonald's for years just to have wi-fi access Access, right? the, the reality is it's just highlighting the fact, and this isn't, this isn't partisan. Everybody believes that all of our kids should have access to broadband. Everybody believes that we should be closing that digital divide because it's so important for everybody to have access to the economy of today, not the, just the economy of the future. And so, yes, you're absolutely right. We have to focus on building that infrastructure. If this speeds us to doing that, that's good. You know, some of the counties, some of the more rural counties have been talking about putting in these, these kind of, uh, you know, um, these t essentially towers for, for Wi-Fi access that are portable and using that. And we're gonna try to amplify that by kid, giving kids their own hotspots and some of the, the you know, uh, youth serving organizations that I've, I've been working with and talking to. And these are all workarounds. The, the fact of the matter is we gotta get broadband available and into every household to make that possible. And again, when we talk about the role of the market, everybody wants to have access to this, everybody needs to have access to this. You know, I'm in a district with 
18,000 farmers, 11,000 farms, and yet and still, there's still almost over a quarter of them who don't have Wi-Fi access. And so how can you be effective in your business if you're not even able to get in touch with folks uh, using the internet? I think it's, it's, a, it's a powerful and important role, not just in education, but I think right now we're highlighting it in education in a major way. Um, and and you, gotta, you have to recognize this crisis, it's highlighting these issues, these inequities, and, uh, and I think it's, it's important for us to lean into and say, hey, let's, let's fix this. Because in rural communities, that's just how we make sure that every, every kid has a chance to succeed and, and live out the life of their dream. That's that American dream. So, yeah. DJ? You mentioned um, one of the fundamental things about what you would like to see in healthcare is to make sure that consumers have the ability to choose where they go to get their care. Uh, how much do you think certificate of public need regimes like the one in Virginia and North Carolina get in the way of that? And what do you think the federal government could do to make them, well, to frankly make them more competitive and less restrictive? Yeah, you saw my facial expression when you said certificates of need. That, that's one of those things that, that we've been battling against for a while. I think, you know, there's the, what compels the notion of need in terms of healthcare is, you know, the needs of the patients, the needs of people. And we're seeing that kind of blowing through that reality with COVID. All the bed shortages that we've had, and we're seeing that in, in so many places. You think you know what the need is, but just by limiting the growth of spaces, you're actually, uh, you know, cutting off your nose to spite your face. You're, you're saying, hey, we're not ha the place that have the capacity to build and grow and have a growing, you know, healthcare system, they're not necessarily always having the opportunity to create that. Um, I think that there, you know, we do need to design our healthcare system in a way that looks at not just the entire Commonwealth, but also the entire country. There are a lot of rural counties that have hospitals that are closing, hospitals that aren't able to thrive, especially through this pandemic, especially when we don't have elective surgeries. So there's a lot about the dynamic in our healthcare system that we have to address to make sure that at a most basic level, folks have access. That idea of need though, that's played out in terms of CAT scanners and MRIs, and that's actually part of a competitive advantage, right? That's part of places saying, hey, we have access to these technologies. And, and a quick story is I was in Spain with my family on a vacation the other, uh, last year. My sister-in-law got sick and spent a week in the hospital in Spain. And as a doctor, I knew she needed an MRI for this infection in her eye. I kept telling the doctors, I was like, she needs an MRI. And they were like, well, we don't have an MRI. So she's going to get a CAT scan. thing that she needs so she got multiple cat scans and then eventually she got an unnecessary surgery on her eye and then they're like oh it wasn't a fluid collection something an mri would have easily told them right and so in this environment when you're just limiting access to to different technologies for whatever reason again you want to allow you know every if every facility has the potential to grow and to have the technologies that are top notch that's us having a healthcare system that really serves everybody well now the question and the challenge is, how does it add to the cost of care? There are a lot of things that add to the cost of care in our system, but yes, it can add to the cost of care, but that's where one thing that I say the Trump administration really got right on healthcare is the price transparency stuff. You see how dramatically different the prices are for an appendectomy from hospital to hospital, and you realize, wow, just the failure to actually share information about how much things cost is the reason we don't have real competition. So I think all of these things, none of them operate in isolation. You have to tie them all together and say, we can do much better. Well, I, th I think uh, kudos to you for in an election season, you know, obviously, you know, Donald Trump is not the uh, top of the ticket for, for your party. Um, but, you know, to tip the hat and be objective and give credit where credit is due is, a, is a, I think, you know, good on you. Good on you. Uh, let's, uh, let's jump back to, uh, let's, let's go to, we can do a little more political stuff now. Let's, let's moral um well it's actually a nice transition because you did throw a throw a, so throw a little compliment to the uh the trump administration anyway let's go to merle and then uh and then brian to talk about the more political aspects of winning the winning the fifth and serving in congress now smile when we say that dr webb because <laughs> there it is i was, I was <laughs> waiting for merle i was waiting for merle <laughs> okay thanks chris dr webb Thanks for being with us today. Uh, if you win an unusually solid Republican district in the fifth, uh, you'll have a target on your back, let's be honest. Uh, just very similar to what Tom Perriello had. Uh, given the distraction of all freshman House members of winning a re-election in only two years, um, how will you balance that requirement with establishing yourself with a very diverse constituency of the fifth? I, you know, I'm a, I'm a consensus builder by nature. I always tell people I'm the third of six kids. 
I never walk into a room thinking it's all about me. I'm always bridging different perspectives. Even as a physician, I'm always, my goal is to walk in to groups, to rooms, to spaces and ask people where it hurts and then listen for an answer and find a path forward together. I think that what, what's exciting to me about this district, what's exciting to me about this opportunity is I'm not doing this with, with the next election season in mind. Maybe that's probably the problem with our, with our politics. You know, for me, I'm focusing on what can I do to be of service right now? I've got a perfectly good job. I, I, do, I serve my community in a perfectly reasonable way and I'm passionate about doing this. Uh, you know, running for Congress is just another way for me to serve my community at a time when we, we sorely need it. And if the people of the district say, hey, job well done, keep going, then I'll keep going. And if they say, hey, you, you served your purpose, you did what we wanted you to do, you listened to us and you, you acted, but now we want somebody else, well, then that's the will of the people. I'm not going to get too bent out of shape about that. But at the end of the day, and again, it's not politics for politics sake. It's about being in a space in a moment in time to serve and to serve well. Um, now, all that said, I think that the reality uh, of this district isn't that it's you know, bright red, as my opponent has suggested, uh, which I think is incredibly flawed. And it's certainly not deep blue. It is a spectrum across the political dynamic. And that's why it's great for me to just step into different spaces and you heard, you know, my, my student, a quick story, my students at UVA, um, they got really up in arms my first year teaching when I brought somebody from the Trump Domestic Policy Council into my class to speak. And they were like, how dare you bring her here? And, uh, and I was like, because this is what civil discourse is supposed to look like. And they were like, you guys disagree on a lot of things, but you like each other. And I said, that's what civil discourse is supposed to look like, right? That's how we move forward as a society. And, and that's what I want to model. That's what I want to be a part of here. And, uh, and I, I believe that it's going to work. I believe that it's the kind of temperament, the kind of ideology that actually sticks, one that tends to listen to the people around them and not just tell everybody, you have to think exactly how I think to be with me. Um, I'm, I, I used to do a lot of debating. I was on the moot court team in law school. I love to talk through the issues, talk through the ideas. Um, and, and if you disagree with me, that's cool. We can still do it in a civil way, but, um, but I'm not focused on re-election. That's not, this isn't a path to something for me. This is a moment to step in and serve. For you. Well, um, I've just got a text here from the New York Times. You're not going to be published ever. So I'm going to go follow up on the politics to, uh, to Brian Shaneman, and then we'll, uh, we'll jump to Matt Walton for a question on education. So all right, I don't want to jump ahead here and assume that you're going to win. Uh, you can do that. That's fine. But I mean, I'll tell. Hey, look, you know, <laughs> as an outside observer, and you know, I am like you. I am a I am a pragmatist and a, and a and a consensus builder, uh, and I am a Republican. But I'm the last Republican labor guy left in D.C. Apparently, so I, I straddle both sides of the aisle quite a bit. Um, I, I think you got a pretty good shot in the fifth. What what happens in November? What do you think your biggest challenge is going to be? Assuming that you get elected, what do you think your biggest challenge is going to be in when you get to the Congress, when you get to the House? Well, I think there, there's a there's establishment in both sides, both both sides of the aisle that uh, that wants to say, now that we've got the numbers, let's do exactly what we want to do. Um, and I think that the problem there is that for folks who go in uh, very decidedly to be a consensus builder, um, you know, it almost feels like you're you're a person without a without a home sometimes. And I think the, the reality is what I always say is my home is the fifth congressional district. It's the people who are here. As long as they're happy with the job I'm doing, I'm fine. And I had an, an incredibly progressive Democrat um, from, from the Northeast who gave me a call the other day. And we had a really interesting conversation about our differences in policy. And what, what the stuff that you don't see play out in the media is they were like, you know what, but you're serving your district well uh, by representing that perspective. And that's really what matters. I know that within my party, at least, uh, and this is where I have to give a nod to Congressman Redfield, within my party, at least, the fact that I have a difference of opinion is one area where they're just like, well, that's cool. Maybe that's what it's like to be a Democrat in VA05. You know, for Congressman Riggleman, this is somebody who was decidedly a moderate. That's how he held himself out. And he tried to hold his ground on that. And he got railroaded in a manufactured convention just for doing that. Like, that's, that's no politics that I think a lot, of, a lot of Virginians want to be a part of. I think the fact that you don't have this strict ideology that meets exactly what I say, and therefore we have to engineer a process to get rid of you, that's the problem. So I think that's not going to happen in my party. They're not, going to, they're not going to primary me because I'm not the most progressive person in the world. And I think that gives us a real shot at building consensus, at having a district that's moving in a direction. Well, they never might, say never. I'm sure Elliot Engel <laughs> never thought he was going to get primary either. Well, they, might, hey, they, I, might, I, they might not successfully primary you, but... Uh, 
Hey, yeah. I, I, I've been I've been in my local Democratic Party for three and a half years. They have no one has even considered throwing me out. So there is that. There you go. <laughs> they would that, let that, me that in. That goes to the heart of being oh. a very large tent, DJ. Let's go to Matt and then Andrea. Well, Dr. Webb, uh, well, thank you for joining us. And uh, I've got uh, two, a two-part education question for you. First, uh, regards the current situation with COVID-19 and what's going on in the fall. Um, I'm a teacher, and there are plenty of teachers out there and also parents uh, that are concerned as far as what education uh, should look like uh, in this current climate. Uh, there's discussions going across all kinds of different school boards in, uh, here in Virginia, different recommendations. Uh, some have decided, some have not decided. From a medical standpoint and also a policy standpoint, what would you best advise uh, local school boards to do regarding um, school in the fall, policies, procedures for teachers to follow? And what would you say to, to, to them? And then um, my next question, I'll follow up later with um, current technical education. Sure. I, the, the, what I'd say is establish really clear metrics. Like, let's take the politics out of this. Let's say, what numbers are we going to go by to say this is what we need to see in order to be open physically in the fall. This is when we see numbers changing and increase in the seven day positivity rate, or when we see something that tells us, hey, we need to pull back, then how do we do that? How are we gonna treat positive cases? How are we gonna design the school so that it is a, actually a safe space? Because there are a lot of things we just don't know about this virus and its transmissibility through children. And we don't need to sit here and navel gaze and, and theorize about what that looks like. What we need to do is be as objective as possible. And, and this isn't just for, for students and for parents, it's for teachers. Te Teachers are the ones who I'm seeing who are saying, I don't feel safe right now. I don't feel like we've got a good plan in place. I would like us to do something more like what I'm seeing from my peers in some different school districts. So I think having real metrics in place, that's the first thing. Um, if you are going to have schools that are open, we need the resources to do so, right? You can't just say, oh, we, we can have plexiglass in different places. Um, we, can, we can use this space in this way or that way, redesign it or have this PPE. That costs money. And the average cost that we're seeing, uh, you know, in so many different counties, average costs are, are in the millions of dollars, right? This isn't, a, this isn't a small thing. So if you're going to do it, then make sure that you've got the resources to do it well or else you shouldn't be doing it. Finally, you got to keep the other side of that coin is, is virtual education. And we can't afford for our kids to fall behind. We just can't. And if you look at inequities in education, the, the kids who have uh, less than lower income kids, those are the ones who are being the hardest hit by this. Because yeah, some kids can go out and get private tutoring and this, that, and the third. But the ones who can't, they're just falling farther behind. It's going to create a generational education gap that we just can't, we can't allow to take place. So if you're going, and that's why I say make a decision and roll with it. You know, and, and that means if we're going to invest in the virtual education, then let's spend our time developing that in a robust way. And that's really where we need to be. And I think the state needs to show some leadership on that and make sure they're helping out our school districts. Um, and, and, and they're giving those clear metrics to our school districts. The school board members I've talked to, Matt, what they say is, you know, when I ran for school board, I was not planning on making decisions on whether or not we should even have school. Like that is not something that was, uh, that, and certainly not from a public health standpoint. So I think making sure we're equipping people to have these conversations thoughtfully, that's the key. And, uh, and, we, and both the state and federal government need to be supportive of school districts that make decisions in the best interests of the, the families and the teachers who live there. Follow up, Matt. And then my uh, second follow up question on, on education. I'm a technology education teacher, which falls under the umbrella of current technical education. Uh, just looking through your website a little bit and your educational policy, uh, you briefly mentioned career technical education a little bit regarding community colleges. Um, what do you see in the, uh, from a current technical standpoint, education-wise in middle school and high school, and especially with the, the Carl uh, Perkins funding that comes from the federal government that is so vital to these hands-on, career-ready um, educational aspects there? What is your vision for CTE in that middle and high school realm? I think it just needs a lot more investment. I think we know that we've got a huge skills gap that's going to be widening in the years to come. When we look at what the jobs that are going to allow people to grow in, in place and for communities to thrive, a lot of them are going to be in these, these skilled spaces. And so career and technical education, that's going to be a, a critical space. We've got, you know, your, your manufacturers that are leaving all across my district, but you know, if you have a skill, that's something you can always build and carry with you and grow. It's not just that, you know, we, we talk about apprenticeships and I, 
I do a lot of work with labor unions. I used to work in a union. And, and so for me, just recognizing those apprenticeships are powerful. That is a pathway throughout your future. And so I think just making sure that, that we recognize in every community, these are things we should make sure that youth have opportunities. That pathway to success, I think there's an overemphasis on going to college. And I know the hypocrisy of that, because like I said, I went to the 25th grade. I spent a lot of money on my education in, in higher education. And, and that's one path for me to be able to do the jobs that I want to do. But for other, for other folks, it doesn't actually require a four-year college degree after school. There are so many things that you can do if we design it properly. So, so middle and high school, that's important. I'll tell you, Matt, one important thing to me, though, is that, is that disproportionately, sometimes we track kids pretty early. So we say, these are the type of jobs that you can have access to, and those are the type of jobs somebody, and this kid is destined for college. I think we've got to make sure every kid can make that decision, can have those exposures and say, this is the, the path that I want to go on and those opportunities are available in their community. Okay, Andrea, and then I'm going to ask a question on manufacturing economic development. Go ahead, Andrea. Um, in the, uh, uh, I guess, continuing vein of what should probably be taken out of politics, um, this is on the environment. Um, I'm, I'm an independent, but I've spent a good deal of time, and I'll spend probably more time trying to explain to conservatives why the environment and protecting the environment, particularly water, um, is should be a natural fit for a conservative because it is so much more expensive to treat 1% of the fresh water we have to be able to drink in the future than it is just not to mess it up in the first place. So I was just wondering if if you if you agreed as far as explaining to the voters and your fellow congressmen, should you be elected, that there are some environmental aspects that really aren't partisan. Yeah, and, and to be quite honest, Andrea, this is probably where you'll hear me sound the most progressive is that I'm just like, what are we doing to our environment? I mean, what are we doing? The, the, the climate crisis one, it's real. Two, it, there is a huge role for, for humans in impacting climate. Three, all is not lost. If we work now to address our climate crisis, we're going to, you know, my, my son is five years old. You know, the, the world that he's going to be an adult in is dramatically going to be impacted by the decisions we make today. And so that's why I say, you show me the science on how we can get to a 45% reduction in carbon emissions by 2030, and I'll say that's the policy we need to follow. You show me the science on how we get to net zero by 2050, because we do need to address climate change. That is a critical necessity for our survival as humans. In terms of the conservationist argument, you know, I, I think similarly to, to, you know, we just had this big victory here um, with the Atlantic Coast Pipeline being canceled here in, in my district. And I say it's a big victory. It's a big victory with a big coalition. You know, so for, for climate crisis enthusiasts who are more progressive on that issue, which like I said, I am, um, I'm happy because it says, hey, let's invest on clean and renewable energy. I love the economic impact of investing in clean and renewable energy and the opportunities there. But for my libertarian friends, they're just like, that's right. Don't screw with my property rights. <laughs> like, don't, don't, don't bring your pipeline through my yard, through my family's homestead. That's not what we're supposed to be as America. That coalition, like, that's who we are. That's who we should be. There's a different reason for us to, to agree that that's the wrong thing to do. So I'm so glad at that outcome. But, um, but yeah, Andrew, I think, I think that, um, I'll, I'll be honest, I, I'm, I gave a, a nod to President Trump on, on price transparency in healthcare. I'll say that I'm, I'm disgusted with how anti-science he is. There's no reason to consistently refute facts and objective information. You have to at least give a nod to the fact that we have more than enough data to tell us to stop doing certain things and to just stop doing it. Okay, so uh, you mentioned manufacturing, leaving the 5th Congressional District. You also celebrate the uh, conclusion of the Atlantic Coast Pipeline and safe to assume that the gas is just going to find another route to the marketplace, probably out through Cove Point and an LNG import facility for the Navy uh, facilities in Norfolk to get that gas into the, to the, to that region. How do you, what do you propose for economic development in the 5th Congressional District if you're, if you're going to oppose any kind of fossil fuel development for manufacturing facilities? You, sound, you kind of like lamented the fact that manufacturing is leaving. What are you going to do to uh, uh, in, in bring in manufacturing to the fifth? There are huge manufacturing opportunities in clean and renewable energy. Huge opportunities. And that's why, like I said, you, you know, uh, even, even with, with pipelines, with solar and hydro, there are huge opportunities. And I think that, you know, the labor unions, you know, I'm, I'm endorsed by the Virginia carpenters, the plumbers, like I, 
I'm more people, right? And the reality is, I know that there are opportunities for them in manufacturing, in clean and renewable energy. The investment in that energy economy of the future is a huge job creator. It's an industry creator. And that's where it's just like, we have huge opportunities here in the fifth. Halifax County has multiple solar fields. Uh, you know, D, for, for DJ and I, you're talking about Spotsy. Spotsylvania has the largest solar field on the East Coast. And the economic impact of having that land that was just sitting there, now creating revenue, now creating taxes for the county, that's huge. And so, listen, there are huge opportunities in clean and renewable energy. We just have to have the forethought to invest in the energy economy of the future, not the energy economy of yesterday. So follow up on that, what, the, what is going to make the 5th Congressional District stand out to attract manufacturing in this sector? And I'm trying to understand, what do you mean by manufacturing and clean energy uh, for that field? I mean, are you talking about the, the, uh, the manufacturing of the, of the solar panels? Or are you talking about the manufacturing of the, of the wind turbines? Um, what, what, all, what, what do you mean and how do you get it to the 5th? You know, b both all of the above. I think that the thing about the 5th Congressional District is from a manufacturing standpoint, that capacity, that capability, and that, that history is there. So we've had lots of manufacturing entities here in the 5th over years, and they've left for various reasons. But again, you know, we have to, every county has to make that argument on how we can get um, those resources here. I think that more broadly, if Virginia is being, uh, you know, part of this broader clean economy, if we're really investing in, in solar hydro, we already have some leading companies in this space already here in the fifth. Uh, and so I think there's, there's some of that that we already have a presence. It's just a matter of propagating it. But, um, but yeah, I mean, you just think about from, a, from the standpoint of energy creation, energy storage, and then um, the way the energy is ultimately you know, transmitted throughout and, and implemented in the grid. That's all, those are all opportunities from a manufacturing standpoint. It's all opportunities from an industry standpoint. And there's also, from an individual standpoint, in individual rights, the ability to create and store your own energy, that's a huge thing for people here in the district. And that's something that people get really excited about. So, so yes, I mean, by, by every account that I've heard, and this is an area, look, I'll, I'll tell you straight up the areas that I don't have the the deepest expertise, but everything that I've learned, everything that I've seen about, about you know, bringing more clean and renewables here to Virginia, here to, to the US, uh, I think it benefits us well. And we, just like we have to make a case for any industry to come into our district, we've got a lot of land, we've got a lot of people who know how to work, we've got a lot of folks who've got a manufacturing background, and this is gonna be a right space for us to, to do a lot of that work here in the fifth. And a lot of final, final on this, if I can, um, I can think of Robert here as the, as the moderator. Um, what are your thoughts on nuclear? I mean, nuclear is cleaner than some others, but again, that's not necessarily the direction that I think we should be going. I think for me, solar, hydro, and wind are going to be the, the energy of the future. I think nuclear also, you know, if you're talking from an environmental justice or environmental, like th that environmental conversation, um, the, the waste, the concerns with nuclear far outweigh the concerns we have with other forms of energy. And so from my standpoint, it's, it's really important for us. If we're designing truly the energy infrastructure of tomorrow, let's really move away. Yes, it's efficient. Nuclear is rather efficient, but it's not going to be as, uh, as clean and as safe for our environment, which is the other side of that equation, is creating energy in a way that doesn't damage our environment. So I, I think I would move on. Well, we look, I'm sure people are going to look forward to updating uh, that one, that conversation with you. I think there's, I think there's going to be some gaps in the math on that one in the data. But I'm going to throw it. I'm going to throw it over to Andrea. I mean, listen, these are big issues. I mean, we're talking massive levels of energy required to get to that clean, renewable future that we all want. And it's a question of time and uh, how much investment we're going to be able to tolerate till we get that. And, and certain bridge fuels that some people don't talk about. But you know, there's a reality and a pragmatism that we all have to understand. Let's go to Andrea and then Matt. And just a quick follow up. New York City, they take the garbage in New York City and they have a, <clears throat> excuse me, they have a facility that actually takes the, uh, the garbage from Manhattan and turns it into energy. I don't know how it works. I do know that it involves steam. Yeah. And so, you know, I imagine they burn it in such a way and they have a way to do it, but it, it, it's, it's very clean and it, and it also held, has the advantage of solving the problem of household garbage on a large scale being used to power homes and everybody knows the closest to the source that you are the better energy you're going to have i mean if you're going to have look at solar the manufacturing there's all kinds of different components but if you can put those panels on houses and you can put those battery packs in an outbuilding on a lot you're going to cut 
not only cut somebody's uh, uh, electric bill in half, if not more, but you'll actually have less of a strain on Dominion and more people putting into the grid rather than taking out. But the, the project in New York City is fascinating to me. It's because they use a household garbage to, to make energy. Okay, Matt on redistricting. Dr. Webb, uh, the, the Virginia Democratic Party recently uh, endorsed opposition to the proposed uh, bipartisan redistricting commission that uh, just went through the Virginia General Assembly. Um, many you know, people were hopeful that uh, they would actually support that. Um, your congressional district, the fifth, is actually uh, larger than six U.S. states uh, geographically. Uh, having run in a gerrymandered district, what are your thoughts on redistricting and do you support uh, the proposed uh, bipartisan commission? Why or why not? And what do you think the gerrymandering has done here in Virginia to, uh, to affect the political climate? Well, what I'll say simply is that I support the idea of fair redistricting. And so uh, I think in terms of weighing the merits of the bipartisan commission versus you know, anything that the Democratic Party may be suggesting, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I don't have a strong opinion right now. I know the district that I'm running in. I, what I will say is that that notion of fair redistricting, that notion of congressional districts that are fair and compact, that kind of meet that constitutional definition and we're representing interests of people who have in some way, shape or form, you know, uh, similarly uh, situated interests, that's important to me. I, I do think the fifth is gonna change uh, geographically uh, in the next couple of years. And I think that's probably right. I always talk about just the, the challenge of, uh, of connecting the interests of folks in Fauquier County that are very far from uh from you know right here in in charlottesville where i'm sitting very far from danville and brunswick this is just by its very design um it's unfortunate and i think that it's unfortunate for for some of the residents here in the district to to have the prospect of a representative who can be four hours away in a in a state like virginia where that doesn't need to be the case so i think that the emphasis has to be on fair redistricting i think that they always say in politics to the victor go the spoils. And I know that in, in 2011, this district was redesigned to make it easier for a Republican. And I understand the allure of making it easier for a Democrat, but I think that we have to be better than, than kind of what other folks have done in the past, that we have to redistrict this, uh, the entire Commonwealth in a way that's fair, in a way that people say, hey, th these districts now make a lot more sense. Do you support the constitutional amendment that will be on the ballot in November, yes or no? Which one? regarding the redistricting reform uh, commission and taking it out of the hands of the General Assembly? I have to do a little bit more digging on that. I think I understand the value of it. Um, and I think that uh, there was also the conversation about the backup of the Virginia Supreme Court also being able to weigh in. But I think for me, um, yeah, I don't think I'm prepared to answer that yes or no quite yet. Okay. I'd appreciate it if you got back to me on that. <laughs> sure, we will do. DJ on uh, foreign policy. Yes, I was just curious as to what your foreign policy priorities would be uh, if, uh, when for your for your time in in Congress, what what are the what are the you know top three to five things that you would be focusing on? I think it's hard to talk foreign policy without talking about holding China accountable. I think that uh, in the conversation of our our current pandemic, um, you know, there's just a lack of transparency with China that I think is important. Uh, but I think that we can't necessarily do that singly through whether it's you know bilateral conversations. It has to be multilateral. We have to bring in kind of the um, the role and the impact of some of our partners all over the world to really put some pressure on China to be a better actor. And I think that's going to be an important thing for us to do. I think this this uh, conversation that President Trump's gotten into with uh, with Beijing has been has been problematic, and I think that's a that's going to be a, you know huge for us to bring other people into that conversation. Um, I think we we have to um, really shore up our, our relationship with Israel. I think that that from our standpoint, we have to make sure that we're supporting our, our best friend and ally in that region, in that part of the world, um, supporting them with their own security, but also being our eyes and ears in that region. And so I think that's a that's an important part of it in in, in maintaining that that relationship in a meaningful way. Um, so I think that's the other one. And then the final thing is uh, just being real. We, uh, we, you know, you can talk about national security and, and COVID expo exposed a huge gap in our national security when it comes to pandemic preparedness. And I think that investment in that preparedness is the key. I think that what President Trump did with, uh, you know, his, 
his uh, lack of, in fact, removing the funding for the World Health Organization, that's actually not in our best interest. Eliminating some of that pandemic preparedness through some of the entities we had here within uh, the federal government, not in our best interest. We have to think more broadly. And, and then just as a, from a you know, baseline philosophical standpoint, um, having our presence in over 150 countries right now physically may not be in our best interest. It may be more effective for us to have more of a diplomatic uh, relationship with so many of our countries. If we're talking about where we can address our you know, $27 trillion deficit and we have got $700 billion of discretionary spending into defense, how can we make sure that we're being really efficient with our presence, whether it's diplomatic or military in places all around the world? And I think leaning into diplomacy, it's an important time for us to a little bit more of that. Follow up on that, if I can, on foreign policy relative to China, I think it's going to be the number one issue in foreign policy because of the pandemic. Do you, uh, do you blame China at all for their role in the, uh, the, the COVID outbreak? I, I certainly think they weren't, they weren't very forthcoming with what they were seeing. And as a scientist, as a physician, um, we're, we're getting a lot of new information about uh, the way the pandemic played out there in China early on. I think that um, with more transparency, we probably would have been able to prepare more effectively. And so I think there's no doubt that, that China wasn't particularly forthcoming with what was happening in Wuhan province. And, and, um, and I think that's problematic. I think the nature and, and the conversation around uh, the World Health Organization's um, being complicit in that, I, I, don't, I don't know that I have enough information to know exactly how that, that played out, but I do know that um, it's, it's, it's critical that any actor, any, any um, you know, state, any country, uh, their ability to share information on something that has global implications, that's critical. I don't think China uh, you know, did that effectively. I don't think they did that in a way that prepared the rest of the world. And uh, I'm glad to hear that they're doing much better with, with, um, with the virus these days. I hope that that's true. Again, who can trust the veracity of, of what reports we're getting out of China sometimes, but I do think that, um, that I think it's pretty clear that they, they weren't forthcoming on the front end and that's hurt the rest of the world along the way. Well, should, should, should there be any kind of retaliation then? Because they weren't forthcoming? I mean, this is not just being on, not forthcoming on something. You know, this, is, this could end up costing quarter million American lives. Yeah. Yeah. And in terms of what retaliation looks like, I think we're going to have a lot of really um, difficult conversations on a global scale with how the world dealt with this pandemic. This is the global pandemic we've been talking about seeing for the last 30 years. That, and I think that because of that, um, there, there is going to be some, some reckoning. I think that, um, you know, the, the role of some of our, our larger entities like the World Health Organization like uh, like um, the UN, just to, in kind of speaking to uh, what China should or could have been doing in terms of economically, um, some kind of sanctions. I, I'm not sure what that would look like or what that could look like, but I think that you know ev everything and anything has to be a part of the conversation. Um, but but I think it's clear from my from my standpoint. I think it's clear that China ultimately saw. Now that said, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a lawyer and I think that, you know, from my standpoint, you, you have a, kind of the comparative negligence notion and it's like, what was our role in the lives that were lost here in the U.S.? I think the failure to have a testing program, that's a huge failure. The failure to have true preparedness when you had months lead time uh, in terms of PPE, that's a huge failure. So we can't count the number of lost American lives and attribute that all to China. There's some negligence on our part. That's a hu that's huge, and there's some negligence in, in our federal government. And I think that if you look at other nations, they didn't have the same pandemic play out the way that we saw it play out here in the United States. And, uh, and so I think there's some accountability we have to have to, to the Trump administration as well. Okay, Dr. Cameron Webb, thanks for joining us. Very impressive candidate, especially in your first run. Uh, maybe that's why you're so impressive. You're not held back by any political stuff you've had to, <laughs> that will come along with you but you had a you had a knockout you had a knockout punch in your primary i think you had 67 percent in a, in a wow. four-way primary which is extremely wow. impressive, extremely impressive numbers uh final thoughts from anyone on the panel as we close it out we want to keep it to an hour and get things rolling here i got a question uh, go ahead andrea you sure mm -hmm. i just was i just thank you again for being here yeah you're you're a fascinating candidate, and I think that you'll probably do very well. And I guess the last question I would have to think to ponder on is maybe had there been the CDC equivalent in China at the time that the uh, that COVID broke out, the communication might have been a little bit better. But I just wanted to say thank you, and thank you for your openness, and best of luck to you. 
And all I would, and all I would say is in terms of looking about what to do about um, potential reaction or retaliation to the Chinese Communist Party, we might want to, we would certainly want to consider bringing our allies closer, as you said. And one way to do that is, is to, is to re-enter, I would say, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which was really one of the excellent ideas that came out of the Obama administration. And is actually, it was so good that it survived our withdrawal. I would say that's something we should look at getting back into. Okay, last one here. I, I would just close by the saying thank you, Dr. Webb, for joining us. And uh, I'm already on record saying that uh, I believe you're going to win the fifth congressional district race in November. I've said that publicly, and uh, uh, I wish the best of luck to you. Thank you, sir. And I owe you, I owe you more information on that uh, Supreme Court <laughs> conversation. So you guys have my information. Get it over to Carter. We'll get you something back. And I'm, I'm sure Brian Cannon, Brian Ross Cannon of One Virginia 2021 will be reaching out to your campaign to get you uh, the information you need because I'm sure he has a lot of uh, people who support that constitutional amendment in your district and you will want to make sure that uh, you are informed you make a, a clean decision on that one. Yeah. That, will, that, will be a, that will be one that goes down the, the wire because the fifth is going to be changed, I think, dramatically in the next round of your district and it's going to affect your your uh, your your uh, district going forward. Anybody else on a hot, hot Friday? Nothing? Dr. Cameron Webb, welcome aboard to Virginia Politics. We wish you the best. If we can be of any help to you, please don't uh, hesitate to call on us whatsoever. But I know you have a busy weekend coming up. Good luck on the campaign trail. We'll talk to you soon. Thanks Thank you. Me. And hey, keep information coming my way. I'm, I always take a learner's posture. I'd love to hear more of your perspective. So keep them coming my way. Look forward to the next time we get to connect. Look forward to it. That's a that's a great candidate right there. Yeah, wow. yeah. I don't know if you know what you just asked for, but you'll get it. I mean, that's, this, is, this is an impressive. This is an impressive candidate. I think it is. Um, win or lose, you've got a you've got a, a future in politics, my friend. Good yeah. luck. Yeah. All right, John. Now there's a there's a basketball team in Charlottesville you want to pay attention to. Get this, get this Dean Smith and Roy Williams thing out of your head. <laughs> oh. Love my Wahoos. Love my Wahoos. Um, Do you? Do you? <laughs> I'm staring in William and Mary right now. <laughs>